Thank you very much. What a kind, kind introduction. I'm thankful for your presence tonight. Hope you've had a wonderful Lord's Day thus far. Um, every time I get invited to come here, I'm always looking forward to being back with you. And I uh, see a lot of familiar faces tonight and, and some new ones. And that's always good. You know, uh, you're talking about downloading sermons onto uh, the uh, server and so forth and to YouTube. Usually they're taking my sermons off of the server at Brown Street. And by the way, Brown Street is in Waxahachie. There'll be a spelling test later for who all can spell it, okay? Just say Hatchie and you'll be fine, all right? All right, let's open our Bibles tonight. We're going to be in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And you see the uh, passage on the screen. We're going to be talking about this tonight. And my goal tonight is to just bring you closer to understanding some things about <clears throat> this great dichotomy of who Jesus is and what he did for me and what he did for you. It is important to see that Jesus Christ is everything that we need. So let's look at the passage. <clears throat> for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, for your sake he became poor, that you through his poverty might become rich. So you see the difference there, that he was indeed rich, but for our sakes, he became poor, that we would be able to become rich in Jesus Christ. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand tonight, but I hope every one of you feel like that Jesus Christ has made you rich. You're saying, well, my pocketbook doesn't show it. The house I live in doesn't show it. But let me tell you, that's not the way Jesus makes you rich, right? Jesus Christ makes you rich in the fact that you belong to him, that you have wealth untold that belongs to you through Jesus. Without Jesus, I would not have those blessings. I would not have that riches, and you would not have it either. And so the story is told. <clears throat> I'm going to have to open up that bottle of water, I think. The story is told about a monarch who reigned in opulent splendor that he had wealth beyond, beyond our imagination, living amid this wealth in a royal palace. But his concern for the common person led him to do something that I thought was re remarkable. It caused him to dress in very poor clothing, leave the palace, and he went down and he began to mingle with the lowest of subjects that were in the area in which he oversaw. And one day he visited a fireman. Now, when I say fireman, you're going to think, oh, they had fire trucks and firemen. That's not what I'm talking about. This man's job was to build fires to heat the water in the bathhouses. And so he had a very low position in life, as we would call it. And so this man dressed in tattered clothes that was there. And the Shah descended a long flight of stairs down, 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 deep into the bowels of this building. And he found this fireman who was sitting on what was then a pile of ashes because he had cleaned out where all the wood had gone and the fires that he had stoked was getting ready to begin again. And the ruler sat down beside him and the two men began to talk and they began to have a conversation and they visited with one another. And at lunchtime, the humble fireman took out his lunch and broke his bread into pieces and shared his water with the rich ruler. Can you imagine how this ruler must have felt? Here is a man sharing his crust of bread, is what we would say, with someone. And then this coarse bread, just barely enough to get you by. And eventually, the shawl got up and left and went back to his palace. But he returned again later. And again, his heart was filled with something where you would say that we had compassion for someone. Anybody here ever have this compassion when you're driving and maybe you're on I-35 and Main Street and there's some people standing at the corner and they're holding a sign, family in need of food, out of work, anything will help. Is anybody moved with compassion when you see that? I am. But I'll tell you, <clears throat> what grieves me more than that is that I live in a city and you live in a city where we have that happen. 
I don't know how to fix it. I'm not that wise. I don't know all the answers. I don't know how we can fix that, but it grieves me, and I don't always know what to do with it. Well, the Shah could not bear to keep up the pretense any longer as he returned several times a week to visit this man. And he decided at one point he was going to reveal himself to this man who was the fireman, stoking this fire and heating the water. He asked the poor fireman to name a gift that the Shah could give to him. He said, anything you want, I am willing to give it to you because your friendship is so special to me. And to his surprise, the fireman sat and looked at him with love in his eyes and looked deeply into his face. And the Shah offered to make him a very rich man and to elevate him to high nobility that people would revere and he would have a great amount of wealth. And he said, yes, I understand, but I understand you. But leaving your palace to come down here and sit with me and converse with me is all the gift that I need. There's no more precious gift than I could ever ask for than you leaving your throne to come here and visit with me. Now, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know where I'm going with that illustration, do you? Jesus Christ emptied himself and came down to this earth and lived among men so that he could make us wealthy. Amen. He could make us rich in Jesus Christ. Amen. You may have been given rich gifts by other people, but he said to this Shaw, he said, you have made me rich by coming and spending time with me. <clears throat> the first thing I noticed when I walked in here today, I saw this table. It's been referenced already this evening. That we pause and we thank God for sending his one and only son. And we gather around this table on the Lord's day and we take a piece of bread, unleavened bread, and some juice, which represents the blood of Jesus Christ. And why do we do that? Because we remember the one who gave his life Amen. for us. I hope we never grow tired of that. We never grow weary of it. It never becomes tradition to us. That it becomes something that we look forward to. And we long for that every single Sunday. Well, I think this parable illustrates about the incarnation of Jesus Christ of who he is and what he did for me and what he did for you, that he came to this earth and he emptied himself and he lived among men. Paul refers to this in verse 9 when he's talking about the king who left his throne in heaven and came to this earth. The Macedonians were people who had not been induced into giving by gimmicks of fear or preaching hard sermons to make people give. That's never the motivation. But rather, it was the heavenly example of giving the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that brought about the grace of giving in their life. You do know, don't you, brothers and sisters, that giving is a grace. You just don't wake up one morning as a teenager and now you're 21, 25 years old, you're married and have a child and you say, oh, I need to think about giving to God. It doesn't work that way. It starts with mowing a yard and giving some of it to the Lord. It starts with a part-time job and maybe a full-time job at Chick-fil-A, wherever it may be. And you learn to give of your means. And then when you are a fully grown adult and you have a large income or a larger income, and you already are in the practice of giving to God. You just don't wake up one morning and realize, I need to be a good giver. It is a grace, but it's something you grow into. Does that make sense? Amen. We grow into this grace. And Paul reaches for the highest example of the ultimate motivation for giving for these Christians that are in Corinth. The apostle is using the example of Jesus Christ to teach the importance of giving. But more importantly, he's teaching us where Jesus came from. And I know you're not supposed to end a sentence with that, but I did. 
He's confirming the fact that the Lord finished what he started. He came and left heaven. He came to this earth and he started something. The verse teaches us, I believe the first thing I want you to see tonight is the pre-existence of the Lord Jesus. Whenever was the Lord Jesus wealthy? I want you to think about it. Can you imagine the beauty of everything that Jesus had in heaven? Wealth beyond his imagination. Anything and everything, God and Jesus and the Holy Spirit were present in Genesis chapter 1 and created the heavens and the earth. And then we see the beauty of that. I don't know if I mentioned this a year ago, and even if I did, you're probably not going to remember it. So act like this is the first time you heard it, okay? I want you to think about when we gather around this table and we pray and thank God for the wonderful sacrifice of his son, but how about if we begin to pray now, men, that we thank God that Jesus left his home in heaven and the glories of heaven to come to this earth that he might live and die for us. I tell you, if that doesn't set your heart on fire, you've got an old dry heart. Because that's exactly what he did. He left everything to come to this earth, to live and to die, so that we could reap the benefits of what Jesus Christ did for us. Well, Jesus certainly was not a wealthy person when he came into this world and was born of the Virgin Mary, this babe of Bethlehem, and certainly not during the 33 years of his beginning to preach and to teach and share with those disciples. He came as a stranger into this world, and the world didn't really welcome him very well, did they? In fact, the world is still not welcoming Jesus It's sad to say that many people in the world today are more excited about Confucius. They're more excited about Mohammed. And we're having more of that in our country. And if we don't turn this thing around pretty soon, we're going to see an influx of that more and more in our country. Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Always has been, always will be. Confucius will not save your soul. He will not forgive your sins. Mohammed will not save your soul. Mohammed will not forgive your sins. Only the blood of who? Jesus Christ will save you from your sin. And when you're baptized into Christ and you have your sins remitted, that means forgiven, done away with, the Lord Jesus says in Acts chapter 2 that he adds you to the church. Now that's the church I want to be a part of. Amen? Amen. And I hope you are tonight because that's exactly the plan. His 33 years of being a stranger in this world, his hands made the world that he was now a stranger in. He came, but he was not accepted. He was not loved and revered. He himself never possessed any property that we ever read about in the Bible. In fact, he had a few people that followed him around. He had some women that followed him around, and they probably took care of his needs financially and oftentimes with his bedding where he would lay his head and some food that he would need to sustain himself as he walked on this earth. The king of all kings left his home in glory to come to this earth and had nothing. You think we serve a great Savior that loves us, identifies with us, understands who we are and what we're a part? Jesus did not have anything. I want you to listen. Jesus did not have anything to bequeath to those that watched him die on the cross. Nothing. All he said was, John, behold thy mother. What was he saying to John? You take care of Mary. That's all he could say. He had nothing. He didn't have a 401k. He didn't have a retirement plan. He didn't have a mansion that the kids could get because there were no children. Jesus was never married. Let me tell you, don't believe, don't buy in to what the world is saying that Jesus and Mary Magdalene had an affair and brought children into the world. 
It's bogus. It's false. Jesus had no one to leave his riches to except for the church. Amen. Isn't that great? That's the Savior that we serve tonight. Our Lord was rich in a bygone eternity, dwelling with the Father, God in heaven, and sharing all the blessings that he had. But he became poor for you, and he became poor for me, and came to this earth and had nothing. Paul describes Christ's descent to this earth from riches to poverty so that believers like me and you might ascend into heaven one day. Mike, I don't know what you believe about this, and neither one of us knows the answer. But my wife will tell you, I have been preaching for years, that I believe that Jesus is going to return in my lifetime. I don't know that for a fact. But I tell you, it behooves me to live a certain way. Because you need to be ready tonight. Amen. Because Jesus could come anytime. We are in the last days, are we not? The mosaical age, the patriarchal age is gone. The mosaical age is gone. The patriarchal age is away. Moses is dead and gone. And now the, the Christian age was ushered in to fact whenever Jesus died on the cross. And so we are in the last days. Young people, listen to me. There is no more time after this. There is nothing you could do nothing you should even think about waiting for later, later, later. I'll obey the Lord. I'll obey the Lord Jesus. There's no time like the present. And I like to say this, there is no present like the time that you give to Jesus. And so we think about what Christ did for us. Through his poverty, we became rich. So next, how did Jesus become poor for us? There's no evidence that Jesus was poorer than anyone on the earth. We could assume by knowing what Jesus did, the Bible says he had no place to lay his head except for a stone. I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a high-rise building to live in. And so Jesus had no place even to lay his head. There's evidence among the Palestinians there that Jesus became poor by giving up his rights that were given to him by God in heaven. And he emptied himself, Paul says in Philippians chapter 2, he emptied himself... Not as something in heaven that he should hold on to or grasp and keep grasping for that, but he let go of that. I love that imagery. He was holding on, but he let go of it, and he came to this earth, and he humbled himself, and he didn't come to be king. Oh, the Jews were looking for a king, but Jesus came to serve one another. So I don't know about you, but if you want to be like Jesus, you need to be a servant. You need to serve other people around you and become more like Christ. As a man, Jesus was subject to several things. He was subject to a place. He was subject to a time. He was subject to other limitations. In the, in the wilderness, he fasted for 40 days and night. I think sometimes the scriptures, we read things so quickly we don't see it. And I've read this numerous times and it just amazes me. The Bible says after 40 days and 40 nights, <laughs> he was hungry. You reckon? <laughs> That's a good Texas word, isn't it? Reckon? He was hungry. He was thirsty. And so Jesus gave up everything to come to this earth. He had limitations. He did not give his eternal power, give up all of his power when he became human, but he did set aside his glory and his rights. He was willing to come to this earth and give up all of the splendor of heaven. I love that. Turn in your Bibles to Philippians, the second chapter. I know you've read it a hundred times. I started to say a hundred thousand times, but then you'd say, don't exaggerate. Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus, he says, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. And was made in the likeness of men. Jesus was a man, but he was also God. You know, I can't tell you how many people I've studied the Bible with over the years. They have trouble understanding this. Why? Why was God, his son, still God, but how could he be man? That is called the incarnation of Jesus Christ. 
He came and took on flesh. And he was born of the Virgin Mary, a woman who had known no man. And the Bible tells us the Spirit of God came upon Mary, impregnated her, and the Son of Man was born from Mary. It's a beautiful thought, isn't it? Because no one else, no one else could have been that person. Jesus was a man, but he was also God. Our Creator came to live among his creation. Isn't that beautiful? Our creator came to live among his creation, to be a part of that. The God of this universe put on a robe as a human being in flesh that we could understand. And more importantly, that he could understand us and to know that we needed a savior because of the sin that was in our life. You know, the Corinthian church was just a hot mess. Is it okay to say that? The Corinthian church was just a hot mess. But let me tell you, the people in the Old Testament, they had their own problems, didn't they? They were busy doing sins and being involved in sins, and they were looking for the Savior. You and I live on this side of the cross, and we look back and see the Savior for what Jesus Christ did for us. And they were longing for a Savior, and He didn't come in their lifetime, but God made a way for them to be saved. And now we are in the Christian age and we're looking back to see Jesus hanging on the cross. But church, let's don't leave him on the cross, right? Praise God, he no longer stayed on the cross. He was put into a tomb that was borrowed from a man named Joseph of Arimathea. And he was in that tomb for three days. And the stone was rolled away. Let me tell you, nobody had to roll that stone away. If you picture that on Easter morning as someone coming out there and mm, grunting and pushing to roll, Jesus Christ walked out of that tomb. And Jesus could have rolled that stone away just as easy as a group of soldiers. In fact, he could have done it easier. And so by coming a man, he became the only one who could act as a mediator between God the Father and mankind. There are people that will tell you today that you have to have a mediator, that you have to go and close yourself up behind a closet and someone speaks to you through a screen window and absolves you of your sins. There is nothing more diabolical and anti-Christian than someone who thinks they have to have that kind of priest to absolve them and forgive them of their sins. The universal church as it's known all over the world is not teaching the truth of God's word. A mediator represents both parties and this is why the Virgin Mary does not qualify for this job of being your mediator. In the Catholic church today, they'll tell you to pray the rosary. They'll tell you to pray to the interceder of uh, Mary and there's nothing in the Bible whatsoever that teaches that. She could not represent God, but Jesus could. And for he was God and he was also man. Paul put it this way. If you'd open your Bibles now to 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 5, he says very clearly these words. Are you there? 1 Timothy 2 and verse 5. For there is one God and there is one mediator between God and men. And listen to this. He is the man Christ Jesus. Amen. I do not know how the universal church gets around this passage to think that a person must go into a closet and speak their sins to be forgiven through a screen window. In the Lord's church today, when someone sins, and let me clarify this, if you've sinned publicly and you're out walking the streets of Flower Mound or you're walking the streets of Louisville or, God forbid, in downtown Dallas and you're doing something you should not do and you've brought reproach upon the church, you need to be down here on the front row confessing your sin. But if you've done something private, that's between you and God. And you can pray right where you sit tonight in the privacy of your home, and you can pray, Dear God, I am so sorry for the things I've done, and I need to be forgiven. And we have this great mediator in Jesus Christ who will forgive us of our sins. At the cross, our mediator Jesus, he not only forgave us of our sins, he paid the bail. He paid the debt. He canceled our sin. And he reconciled us to God. 
He reconciled us. That is an accounting term. We may have some accountants in here where you have numbers on one side of the ledger, then you have another set of numbers on this side, and these two sets of numbers need to be reconciled. They need to come down to the bottom, and the line is drawn, and they cancel out each other, or they're equal. Jesus Christ reconciles us from our sins that we have committed against God, and now we are forgiven. He came from the courts of heaven, and yet he could represent man, for he was clothed in the garment of humanity. Jesus Christ lost everything, gave up everything to come to this earth and live as a human. He could represent man, and Jesus carried man's burdens. He endured man's agonies, and he suffered man's sorrows, and he was tested by man's trials and his temptations. I have a dream for you, and that is that one day you'll get to go to the Bible lands. Uh, there may be some in here tonight who have been there. But I can tell you there are many, many places that touched my heart and touched my spirit. But in the Garden of Gethsemane, when they believe, and I would say that there is a great possibility that this is the place, but there was a great stone where Jesus knelt over or fell over. And the Bible tells us that he grieved for what was going to happen with him and sweat drops of blood came out of his skin. Does that sound like someone who had a great love for you? I hope it does. Because he went to the cross and died for you. He emptied himself and gave up the glories of heaven so he could do that. Jesus Christ carried man's burdens and he was tested by man's trials and even his temptations. He lived next as a man among men and died a man's death. I hope that you will get this mental image out of your head and that you'll just throw it away and remember it no more. If you have this man hanging on the cross that is pasty white, that looks like he's about 90 pounds, emaciated and as weak as a kitten, let me tell you, our Lord was a hunk. He was strong and he endured the cross. And he hung there for six hours. And he died for me and for you. Jesus Christ was not a wimp. Jesus Christ was a man. And he hung on the cross and he died for us. The next, he lived as a man among men and died a man's death. I like to think that he was infinite. But yet, he became intimate with me and you. Because see... If you were the only person on the face of this earth and you had done something to transgress God's word, Jesus Christ would have died for you. Amen. He would have died just for you because there's no other way for you to be able to get into heaven except through the what? The precious blood of Jesus Christ. And I want you to think with me tonight. All in the Old Testament... Have you ever paused for a moment and thought about how much blood was offered by bulls and goats and rams and offered on a sacrifice and it was poured out and their little necks were cut and the blood pulled forth and then all of that blood, you go all the way from the time of, of creation almost to the very time of Jesus Christ. And let me tell you, all that blood did nothing to save me and you. But what it took was one Precious, royal, ruby, red drop of Jesus Christ's blood on the cross to save us from our sin. Why? Because he was God's son. He is God's son. He, he, he was perfect. The perfect, what do we say? The Lamb of God. You remember when John the baptizer saw Jesus coming up the road? And, and Mike, I, I like to vision this in my mind. And seeing Jesus coming up the road and John is here and he sees him and he pauses for a minute and he says... Behold the Lamb of God. Amen. Oh, wouldn't you like to have been there, church, to see that? Behold the Lamb of God who saves us from our sin. And yet, what did they do to him? They mocked him. They beat him. They, they flogged him. They tore his skin asunder. And then they hung him on the cross. And they nailed him there with his hands and his feet. And then just to make sure, they thrust a, spur, a, a spear rather into his side. And blood and water both came forth just to make sure that he was what? Dead. 
And then they came along and said, well, we need to rush this up. The sun is going down, and so let's break all their legs, and that way it'll speed this up. They came to Jesus, and he was already dead. They did not break his bones. Sometimes I will hear men pray at the Lord's table. Stay with me. Sometimes I'll hear men pray at the Lord's table. We thank you for this broken body of Jesus. Let me tell you, I have no problem with that. Because when you have a, a spear thrust into your side, you've got a broken body. Amen? When your skin has been flogged to where it's just torn to pieces, you have a broken body. So let's don't get hung up on technicalities and say some brother's prayer was not scriptural. We're missing the point, church. Jesus Christ's body was broken. It was torn asunder. And he did it for me and he did it for you. Amen? Amen. Let's never forget it. He is the divine sovereign who became the human sufferer for me and for you. He was the God-man. And though a man, he did not surrender what he wanted to hold on to. He surrendered everything for the sake of God. He emptied himself. When you empty a glass of water, you don't keep back a third of it or a fourth of it. You empty it. You pour it completely out. That's what Jesus did. He emptied himself from heaven and came to this earth. I jotted down a few things. I'm going to say them rather quickly because if I don't get on with this, y'all are going to have to have me back tomorrow night. Okay? So here we go. we got 15 minutes. As a man, Jesus got tired. But as God... He said, come unto me, all you that labor are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Amen. As a man, he wept like Lazarus. As God, he raised Lazarus from the dead. As a man, Jesus was despised of men, and as God and the angels of heaven, they worshipped him. As a man, our Savior got hungry. But as God, he fed thousands with the little boy's lunch. Remember that? On more than one occasion. And as a man, a boat carried him across the Sea of Galilee and other places, but particularly there. And then, as God, he walked on the top of the water in a raging storm. You think we serve a great God or what? And as a man, our Lord God got thirsty. And as a God, he gave us living water to drink. Isn't that beautiful? And as a man, Jesus got tired and slept. But as God's son, he arose from the sleep on the back of that boat, and he calmed the storm. As a man, Jesus could die, but as God, he could not remain dead. God had to become man to die for us because God, listen, God cannot die. Amen. Nietzsche said years ago, God is dead. God is dead. You remember reading about that? Nietzsche was wrong because God is alive and his son is alive because I just spoke to him today. Amen. And Nietzsche was wrong. In response to the Father's will, Jesus limited his power. Christ became poor when he became human. He became poor when he became human because he set aside so much for me and you. So when we gather around this table on the Lord's Day, let us all think about what Jesus gave up to come to this earth and then we gather around this table and we pinch that bread and we drink of that cup and it should never, never, God forbid, ever become mundane to us. It should renew our spirit. It should make us think about what Jesus Christ did for me and for you. Amen. The Lord Jesus Christ is the sun on which all telescopes of time have failed to find a flaw. Oh, he's been examined. He's been dissected. He's been torn apart. People have tried to find something wrong with Jesus and everything that he preached. But let me tell you, it is impossible because he is God. And he would never lie to us. Our Lord is, in fact, God's truth. When Jesus says something, you can take it to the bank. He is the purity of God's nature. He is the reality of God's love, the surety of God's promises, the majesty of God's power, the authority of God's throne, the piety of God's heart. He is the re repository of God's fullness. He is the legacy of God's will. Everything that we believe is in him. When Jesus Christ came to this earth tonight, he came from the coronations of heaven to be condemned by the evil men of this world. That's what happened to him. And the excellencies of heaven 
were surrendered to experience a Roman execution. Now, I want you to think about that. He left the excellencies of heaven to come to be executed and die for my sins and for yours. He came from the favor of God's face to the fury of an angry mob. You remember when Jesus came into Jerusalem? We usually talk about this usually around Easter time. That's not bad. We should do that. But Jesus came into Jerusalem. They were throwing palm branches before his feet. Remember that? And they were crying out, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And a day later, they were crying out, nail him, nail him, nail him. Talk about dichotomy. One day you're riding high. The next day you're brought lower than you've ever been. Hallelujahs were replaced with hisses and mocking and scourging that followed. And the tender ears of the Son of God that enjoyed the songs of heaven had to listen to the mockery of men. It's amazing. The dichotomy of what Jesus Christ did for you and what he did for me is incredible. I want to close tonight, and I want to put this on the screen for you. The author of this song eloquently made this perhaps one of my favorite songs. You know it very well. We're going to sing it, I hope, here in a moment is the invitation song. If not, brother, can we do that? If that isn't love. He left the splendor of heaven knowing his destiny. It was the lonely hill of Golgotha there to lay down his life for me and for you. Even in death, he remembered the thief hanging by his side. And then he spoke with love and compassion. And he took him to paradise. If that isn't love, the ocean is dry. There's no stars in the sky and the little sparrows can't fly. Yes, if that isn't love, then all of heaven is just a myth. There's no feeling like this if that isn't love. Amen. 2 Corinthians 8 and verse 9. For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor. Will you think about that this week? I hope it will carry you over to the hump day and it will bring you back next Lord's Day. And when you gather around this table, you remember what Jesus Christ did for me and for you. If you're here in this audience tonight and you're subject to the invitation of Jesus, you've been listening to good sermons, you've been in Bible class, you know what you need to do. Uh, there may be some young people, there may be some adults here tonight, never obeyed the, the, the voice of Jesus Christ, and he longs to save you from your sins. There's only one way to be saved, and that's Jesus' way. Don't let the world tell you anything different. God's way is always the best. If you need to respond to the invitation, we're going to stand, we're going to sing.